In this lecture, I'm going to talk about plot in narratives and how to break down and discuss plot. So first, let's define what plot is. Very simply, a plot, or the plot, is the arrangement of the action, that is, the events in the story, um, in the literary narrative. It's just the way they are arranged. So it's the story of what happens, essentially. And why is the plot important? Well, it's the structure of the text. It's what gives shape to the story. Um, and it, of course, shows what the characters do and how they change. And in doing so, it suggests cause and effect, which is usually a very important thematic part of the narrative. And perhaps most importantly, or most basically, plot is why we read. We read to read a story, read about things happening to characters. The most basic way to think about the structure of a plot is to divide it up very simply into beginning, middle, and end, and to think about what happens in each of these points. Well, at the beginning of the story, there's a world, some world that we're in. It's established. We see the characters and something happens. There's a change that happens to the status quo and thus the story begins. The middle of the story, which of course is the longest point, is where all the various events happened, um, the characters respond to the effects, to the events that happened, uh, and further events occur based on the actions of the characters, and so on and so forth. Finally, we come to the end of the story, where all the events that we've seen coalesce into some new situation, some new status quo. And as a result of all that's happened, the characters are changed. Perhaps the world in which they live itself is changed. So basic beginning, middle, and end of a story. A more detailed and complex structural map was invented by Gustav Freytag, a German author and critic in the 19th century. And what Freytag did is he looked at a bunch of different narratives, a bunch of stories and novels and plays, and he tried to isolate what are the key things that happen in every story? What are the basic elements that make up pretty much every story? And he constructed this pyramid. Begins with an exposition, something happens to incite the action, we have the rising action, all the various events of the story, which lead us to a conflict and cl climax, um, this results after that in a falling action. Finally, things are resolved in the conclusion. So this is the basic pattern that Freytag used. And again, this isn't something that novelists or story writers follow, but rather it's something that he discovered that seemed to be underlying pretty much all narratives. Let's define some of these terms. Uh, the exposition the, is the beginning of the story where the situation is established. The characters are introduced. The world, as it were, is, is described to us. So it exposes the world, thus the word exposition. And this is often very brief, one of the shortest parts of the story. And the exposition is interrupted by the inciting incident. This is what sets the plot in motion. It's something that happens that creates a conflict and it inserts change into the situation. This may be a literal event, something actually happens, or it can be an internal change of perspective, something internally within a character. And sometimes in more complex stories, it's often difficult to pinpoint exactly what the incident is that incited the action. But you want to figure out when does the conflict emerge, what changes that causes this story to take off. That word conflict is very important because conflict is really central to all stories. There is no story without conflict. And the conflict is the struggle between opposed forces, and that's i.e. the protagonist and the antagonist, which in the character lecture I talk more in detail about what those are. So the conflict is really what fuels the story, is what keeps it going. And there are two basic types of conflict, and these are not exclusive. You can have both in a story. There's external conflict, which is obvious. That's the struggle between the main character, the protagonists, and some external force. This could be other characters, could be social institutions like the law, it could be the natural world, or it could be the divine, the supernatural. It could be God or some supernatural force that the main characters are struggling against.
Then there's also internal conflict, and that's when the protagonist is struggling with some aspect of herself. So forbidden desires, conflicting motivations, psychological trauma, etc., etc. Something internal that motivates, that fuels the story. And again, these can both be in the same story. A story can have internal and external conflicts. Often the external conflicts and the internal conflicts mirror each other in some way. So think about what is at stake in this story, who's in conflict with whom, and how does that motivate the action. Further into Freytag's definitions, the rising action, this occurs after the inciting in incident, and these are the events that are set in motion by that inciting incident. Um, and the situation continues to develop throughout the story through additional complications or new conflicts. So an event might occur, the characters respond and act that might complicate things further or cause a new conflict, thus another event, another event, right? So um, this is the longest part of the story. This is the main section of the story that we're really interested in. This is where the important events happen. And these complications, again, this is where a new conflict or an intensification of an existing conflict occurs, and this moves the plot along through this rising action. Crisis and climax are two very closely related terms. Um, many people will say that they are essentially the same thing. Others will say that there is a difference between the crisis and the climax in a story, or there can be. Not very important for our purposes, but just to be aware of these two terms and what they mean. So the crisis is the moment of the most extreme conflict in the story. And again, this can be the same thing as the climax. Some people will say that crisis and climax are identical. Uh, but the crisis is when the protagonist faces their most extreme challenge or things are at their worst or most intense. Um, and again, this can be the same thing as the climax. This is the turning point in the story where the action stops rising and begins to fall towards the resolution. So this is sometimes a particular event um, in which the conflict is settled one way or the other. So the high point at the story, when do we reach our moment of most conflict, most problems, most intense energy, and when does it start to turn towards reestablishing a new status quo? And that's the point of the crisis and or climax. After the climax, we have the falling action. This is when the conflict or conflicts begin to move towards resolution. Uh, the consequences of the crisis start to unfold, and this is usually very short. It's sort of wrapping things up, tying up loose ends. And finally, we have the resolution and conclusion. And again, some people will divide these into two different events or portions of the text. Other people will say they're essentially the same thing. Um, the resolution or the conclusion is when all the conflicts have been resolved to some extent or another. Um, the world and the characters have been transformed in some way. There's a new situation, a new status quo, a new normal after the destabilization that had occurred with the inciting incident. Again, this is usually very short. Depending on the nature of the story, this can be more or less quote unquote satisfying. Um, especially modern stories, it's more common to have endings, conclusions that don't tie up all the loose ends, so to speak, that leave things unresolved, leave some things unresolved, leave us with some questions. Why? Because that's seen as more realistic um, to real life, because real life very rarely has settled, stable conclusions. And again, just because the conflicts have been resolved doesn't mean they've been resolved in a happy way. The resolution could be the good guy's dead, the bad guys have taken over but it's, that's the new status quo. So these are the terms that bring us to the end of Freytag's Pyramid. How do we analyze plot? Well, there's a number of things you want to keep in mind. Um, what's the structure of the events? How do they proceed from one to the next? Um, what's the logic of it? And is there a cause and effect that's implied, either a literal cause and effect that is something actually physically causes something else to happen, or a figurative cause and effect, um, which we'll talk about in a second. What's the relationship between the events? And that's, again, figurative as, and metaphorical as well as literal. Are there similar types of events that occur, or opposed events that might occur? For example, someone at one part of the story, something very good happens to them. Later on, something very bad happens to them. 
for example. And this leads you to highlighting patterns and important details, patterns of repeated types of actions that happen to certain characters or in a certain place, etc., etc. And finally, we ask ourselves questions of fate, free will, destiny, etc. How much free will do the characters have to affect their environment? Are they locked in by certain aspects of their situation? Are they controlled? Uh, how does the plot, um, how are they free or not to affect what actually happens in the plot? An important distinction to make is plot versus action. Um, action we might say, is the events in the story in the order in which they occur. So the chronological order of A to B to C to D. I woke up, I put on my clothes, I went to the store, I bought some milk, whatever. Now the plot is the events in the story in the order in which they are told. Now perhaps I tell the story, I woke up, I put on my clothes, I went to the store, I bought some milk. But I might tell that story in another way. I might tell it in a non-chronological way. I could start that story saying, I was driving to, to the store to get some milk, and I remembered how I felt when I woke up that morning and put on my clothes. Then I got to the store, etc. So things can jump around in the story. So the plot is not necessarily chronological. So again, while the events that are narrated in the story might have occurred in time in a certain pattern, in a certain order, the way that story is told, it, the events can be told in a different order. And what's the effect of that chronological versus non-chronological? Well, sometimes that can build suspense. That can build suspense by jumping around from time to time. You know that something's going to happen in the future, but you're not quite sure what. Or you know that something's happened in the past. You don't know what it is, but you know it's an important event. Uh, it can create new patterns and juxtapositions. Again, for example, if we're in, in a story and then we go to something that happened earlier, it might give us a whole new context or new understanding of the event that's occurring in the present. And in non-chronological stories, uh, we see what are called flashbacks and flash-forwards, where an event from either the past or the future in the narrative is inserted in the present moment. So again, we might be um, in a scene and a character remembers something that happened to them 10 years before, and it adds new meaning. It gives a new context because it makes that event in the present all the more rich for its connections with these events in the past. A related issue of in what order the events are told is where in the story we begin. And these two terms, these two Latin terms, in media res versus ab ovo, these are two different ways to that we might think about beginning a story. Uh, so in media res is the Latin for in the middle of things. Um, and this is where the story starts in the midst of the action. The larger story is already underway. And so the exposition or the backstory is revealed along the way, perhaps through flashback. So we start right at the beginning of the action, jump right in. Um, ab ovo, which means from the egg, means the story starts at the absolute beginning possible. Um, so like the origin story, you might say. Generally speaking, since antiquity, in literary criticism, in media res has been preferred. It's viewed as a more artful, more pleasing, more powerful way to start a story. So, for example, you might have heard of Homer's Iliad, a great epic poem from ancient Greece. It's about the Trojan War. It doesn't start at the beginning of the Trojan War. It starts nine years in. It starts at the beginning of the tenth year of the Trojan War. So it begins in the middle of things, in media res. It doesn't begin ab ovo. Um, so, and the term, this is where the term ab ovo comes from. The war was fought over Helen of Troy, and she was magically hatched from an egg. So to begin the story ab ovo would have meant going all the way back to her birth, going all through her life to the events of the war and all the way through those, which would, of course, been much longer, much broader, much more probably boring and tedious to read. So in media res is generally what we say, what we like in stories.
So how does plot affect the meaning of the story? As opposed to just being the things that happen, what do we actually understand about what the story is communicating beyond the literal through its plot? Well, the relationships of cause and effect that are suggested by the plot often suggest some important themes in the story. So we ask ourselves questions like, what choices are offered to the characters? And how do they respond to those choices? What are the consequences of their actions? And what can we learn from that? Is that thematically important? And does the character deserve what happens to them based on their actions and the consequences of those? And, of course, also based on the theme, the mood of the story itself. So these are some questions we can ask ourselves to start thinking about how the plot actually creates meaning besides just literally telling us what happens. So some basic examples, just using the Little Red Riding Hood story as an example. So here's one version of that story. Mother sends Little Red Riding Hood to take food to Grandma. Mom says, don't leave the path because the forest is dangerous. Little Red Riding Hood ends up leaving the path because she sees some flowers. She gets lost, and the big bad wolf eats her. The end. Okay? So in that version of the story, Little Red Riding is prevented, presented with a choice. Listen to your mother or disobey your mother. Stay on the path or go into the woods. She chooses to disobey and go into the woods, which leads to her death. So what's the meaning of this plot? Well, one meaning we might take from it is that children who don't listen to their parents or who deviate from the quote-unquote normal path will get into big trouble. So that's one meaning from this particular plot. Here's another version of that story. Mom sends Little Red Riding Hood to take food to Grandma. She says don't leave the path because the forest is dangerous. She leaves the path anyways. She gets lost and a big bad wolf eats her. But luckily, a big strong hunter comes by, kills the wolf, and cuts Little Red Riding Hood out of its belly and saves her. This is actually close to one of the traditional versions of the Little Red Riding Hood story. So, very similar plot. She's presented with a choice. She chooses to disobey, and that leads to her death, but she's rescued by the hunter. So, if we take into account the cause and effect of these events and how they occur, what figuratively seems to be suggested, what uh, meaning might be suggested, well, one meaning we could get from this version of the story is, well, a woman may not make the right decision, but if she's lucky, a strong man will come along and save her. So that's the meaning from, perhaps, from this version of the events, this particular plot. One last one. Mother sends Little Red Riding Hood to take food to Grandmother. She says, don't leave the past because the forest is dangerous. Little Red Riding Hood sees the flowers, walks into the woods. She gets, gets lost and is attacked by the Big Bad Wolf. But... Little Red Riding Hood had trained in mixed martial arts with Ronda Rousey, so she knocks a wolf in the next week, takes the food to Grandma, goes home, and grew up to become, become president. The end. So, very similar events at the beginning. She's presented with a choice. She chooses to disobey that choice, but she can handle herself because she's strong. She's trained, and she's confident. So, what's the meaning that we could get from this plot, from this series of events? Well, one meaning we might get is a strong, confident woman can make her own paths in life. Doesn't need to be scared of anybody else. So these are all very simple examples that I've given you, obviously. But the idea is, even in a simple example like this, very basic events, there's this cause and effect that's implied. And there's a certain morality, even, perhaps, that's implied that helps us to see what is it that these events mean? What can I learn from these events? So to review, when you're thinking about plot, here are some good questions to ask yourself. What is the world of this story like at the beginning? What is normal in this world? What's accepted in this world? And again, this world can be very different from our world. If you're reading something that's science fiction or set in the past or the future or a different cu culture, right? So what is normal in this world? What conflicts arise in that world? What are the actions or events that set that story in motion? What happens to challenge that status quo of what's normal or accepted? Or challenge the situation that the characters are in? How do the characters then react to those changes? Perhaps how do they, the characters even cause those changes? How do their actions 
contribute to the ongoing plot? What is it that the characters do that keeps this plot in motion? Where in the story does the most conflict, tension, danger seem to be? What's the climax? Where's the point at which things seem to be its most important decisive moment? It'll go one way or the other to resolve this conflict, tension, danger. And what actually happens to resolve it? At the end of the story, what's the new status quo? What's the world like at the end of the story? How has it changed both the world and more importantly, perhaps, the characters. How have they been transformed? If you think about these questions, and again, these are some very basic questions, but they'll help you to start understanding how plot is not just a list of events, but it's something that creates meaning. It's a particular structure and artistic effect that creates meaning in the story, and it's part of what the, the author uses to communicate their ideas.